Good morning. We start this morning with general questions. Question number one from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when Ministers last met representatives of the Forestry Commission trade unions and what issues were discussed. Minister Hamza Youssef. Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary, last met representatives of the Forestry Commission trade unions on the 10th of May 2017. The meeting was arranged to share with the unions uh, and indeed the Cabinet Secretary decisions about the future organisational structures in advance of the public announcement that accompanied the publication of the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill on the 11th of May. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can I ask if he's aware of concerns from forestry staff around the way in which the Forestry Commission's current appraisal system is working? Minister. Yes, uh, the government is uh, aware of some of those concerns. I know a meeting uh, was arranged subsequently uh, to that conversation. I think it was on the 8th of June with senior management uh, of FES and the trade unions. Uh, what I would say to give the member some element of reassurance is a few things. First of all, there is a review of dear management of the National Forestry Estate. That one of those, uh, one of the aspects of that review, will be to identify the core, competen core competencies and also to complete a skills gap analysis for wildlife rangers, wildlife rangers managers, uh, deer management officers uh, and forest management officers uh, as well. So that review, we should give it the time and the space to be undertaken. Uh, I know that the relationship between FES, uh, FCS indeed, and uh, the trade unions is a very good and a very positive and a constructive one. But if there are further uh, um, issues that the member wishes to raise or anybody wishes to raise, uh, then of course the government will impress upon FCS and FES to listen closely to those concerns. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Minister what guarantees he can give that existing skills and knowledge will be maintained during the transfer of staff. Minister. Well, there's a range of things that can be done and are going to be done. And I try to give again the member some reassurances. Uh, around some of that, first of all, the, the, we tried to allay some of these fears by confirming that there will be a no compulsory redundancies in uh, Forestry Commission and Forestry Enterprise Scotland as a result of, these, uh, of completing the devolution of forestry. Uh, all staff within FCS and FES will be within the scope of transfers to new structures. I think really importantly, though, some of the reassurances we can give is around the local skills that the member talks about. And I can confirm that the local office network will remain uh, ensuring con uh, continued focus uh, on local engagement uh, and knowledge. Uh, and in addition to that, the member will probably be aware that the transfer is being taken uh, forward under COSOC, the Cabinet Office Statement of Practice, similar to 2 uh, the rights in existing terms and conditions of staff will be protected on transfer. Any changes to that or any, uh, indeed, uh, alignment to Scottish Government uh, terms and conditions would very much be subject to consultation and, indeed, negotiation with the unions. Question number two, Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on plans to build a new Belford Hospital in Fort William. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. NHS Highland have started work on the service redesign aspect of this project and they are working on the, the clinical brief and establishing the service planning data for the existing services in Loch Arbor. They are developing a business case and taking an option appraisal exercise that considers how the services can be delivered with the assumption being that the balance of care will move towards community health services. Once this work has been further progressed, the business case will be submitted to the Scottish Government for review. Kate Forbes. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The SNP Government designated the Belford Hospital as a rural general hospital in 2008, which provided additional support and services for healthcare professionals and the local community. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure my constituents that the current level of care will be enhanced and that the new Belford will be retained as a rural general hospital? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I can say to Kate Forbes that the, the replacement for the, the Belford will continue as a, a rural general hospital and that services will be provided as part of a wider redesign across Loch Arbor. Uh, NHS Highland will uh, look to enhance the current level of local services where it's safe and sustainable to do so. I'm very happy to keep the member updated on progress being made. And Donald Cameron. One of the issues raised with me by local groups in Loch Abba is the very slow progress involved here. For example, they speak of a series of cancelled meetings. Will the Cabinet Secretary impress upon NHS Highland the need for early and regular engagement with the local community, in particular the steering group? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, yes, I, I will do that. I think it is important that uh, local communities are, are engaged uh, with the uh, discussions going forward. But I, I'm sure Donald Cameron will appreciate this. This is quite a, a complex project and there are procedures laid out in terms of the business case uh, needing to, to come forward. That has to be a robust uh, business case. The Capital Investment Group uh, will look forward to receiving the business case. And uh, again, uh, happy to, to keep the member updated, but I certainly will relay uh, that uh, comment to make sure that local people are kept fully informed. And Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Loch Aber and Fort William especially is regarded as the outdoor capital of Europe. Um, the Belford Hospital has built a lot of expertise around treating accidents um, associated with outdoor sport. Can she reassure people that it will keep that expertise and indeed develop it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Yes, I would, would certainly uh, want to make sure that that happens. I certainly appreciate uh, the number of, uh, of major events, whether that's mountain biking or other events that take place within the area. And of course, due to the nature of some of those events, um, the accidents that, that have happened, the, the, uh, those uh, who have suffered those accidents have been taken to the local hospital where they've received excellent treatment. And I think that's a very important aspect of that service. Again, I will relay uh, those comments, but I would certainly see the, the new hospital uh, maintaining uh, that level of, of, uh, of care for accidents and emergencies that come in through those, those events and, and indeed other. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussion it's had with unions regarding the future of its public sector pay policy. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Both First Minister and I meet regularly with trade unions to discuss a range of matters, including public sector pay policy. The First Minister has already indicated that the existing pay cap is becoming increasingly unsustainable and will be looking to take a different approach in the 2018-19 public sector pay policy. As in previous years, we will engage with unions during the development of the policy, both at ministerial level and at official level, and expect to publish this as part of the draft budget towards the end of the year. Patrick Harvey. I'm pleased to hear the Minister say that the pay cap is unsustainable. Uh, the, the government has indicated that it intends to move away from this, but I think we uh, all deserve to hear a little more detail. When, when pay restraint was first introduced, it was seen as a short-term measure to avoid job losses in the face of UK government cuts. And since then, we've not only seen pay levels erode year after year, but we've also seen the Scottish Government gain the powers, both on taxation and borrowing, to allow it to make different choices than those that the UK Government has forced upon it in the past. Uh, now that they have these options, can the Government at least commit to ensure that everybody earning the average full-time salary or below will get a, an above inflation increase in the next year? Would that not be a basic minimum that we have a right to expect? Derek Mackay. Well, Patrick Harvey is uh, right that many of the decisions had been taken in the context of fiscal policy largely led by UK government at the, the time. Uh, of course, that financial position has changed in terms of the economic levers uh, that we have and the choices uh, that we can make, and that certainly will be considered uh, as we go forward. Of course, yesterday we saw the, the latest Tory U-turn in terms of this particular policy, a number of U-turns over the course of the day, I understand, and the Tories' magic money tree didn't extend to public sector uh, workers. But this government has committed to lifting the pay cap. We will engage with trade unions. I can't make a determination today, but I will engage uh, positively with the trade unions. Of course I will, and I've committed to a meeting with the STUC. And we understand the issue of those in the lowest incomes within the workforce. Uh, the reduction in spending power is a consequence of rising inflation. And that is why we have a position that will take account of both public finances and the cost of living. And the First Minister has made that clear that the 1% pay cap will not be assumed for next year or future years. And in addition to all of that, we have targeted support to the lowest paid as well. There is a divergence with UK pay policy around our position on progression, targeting support to those low paid, what we've done around the living wage and our social policies, and of course our position on no compulsory redundancies, which is in sharp contrast uh, to the policy uh, south of the border. But I look forward to positive engagement with other parties and of course trade unions. Colin Smith. 
Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday in the UK Parliament, SNP MPs who are not in power, they are voted in favour of a Labour motion to scrap the pay cap on public sector workers. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore explain to those public sector workers in Scotland why in this Parliament, where the SNP are in power, mm -hmm. every single SNP MSP voted against the motion from Labour that read, and I'll read it again, this Parliament believes that the NHS pay gap should be scrapped and NHS staff would be given a real terms pay rise. Why did the SNP vote against that motion? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, Colin. Colin Smith just quite clearly didn't listen to a word no, I said in giving no, the answer uh, to the question no. that I was asked. And do you know what this government will do? We'll take into account inflation going forward in terms of the pay policy of this government. What the Labour Party proposed, remember, was basic rate tax rises for the workers uh, of Scotland, including public sector workers as well. So we'll take a reasonable approach in this, and one that has absolutely recognised uh, that the time is up uh, for the 1% pay cap not only will the SNP commit to it, we'll do it. Question number four, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Bear and Transport Scotland regarding the management of roadworks on motorways. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, Bear Scotland manages and maintains the M90 motorway under the Trunk Road Terms Maintenance Operating Company contracts with Scottish ministers. Transport Scotland holds monthly meetings with all of its operating companies, including uh, Bear Scotland to discuss a programme of works, including roadworks on motorways in each of the units. Further meetings are arranged uh, as necessary. Liz Smith. Thank you, uh, Minister. I wonder if in the next set of discussions that you have, you could include some discussion about the uh, importance of gantry signs and the relevance of the information that are upon them. Uh, as you know, that the M90 has had very understandable delays because of the Queen's Ferry crossing, but there have been very considerable difficulties around the Kinross roadworks as well. And many of the gantry signs have not been appropriate with relevant information to the extent of these and what uh, decisions that drivers have to make. Could you include that in the discussions that you have? Minister. I, I certainly will, and I thank Liz Smith, because I know she's raised this uh, in, in previous uh, question times uh, as well and I can confirm that there are a number of uh, upgrades to available messaging signs uh, that are taking place uh, that are more uh, provide for more functionality but I will take that point back but it's not just about variable messaging signs it should also be about getting information out to local radio stations over social media and so on and so forth so we're always working with the operating companies to see what more we can do uh, in order to give uh, drivers and those roading, using the roads as much notice as possible particularly when disruption is sometimes inevitable because of essential roadworks that take place but yes I can give a commitment that uh, we'll raise this issue in the next meeting that I have with uh, an officials have with Bear Scotland. Question number five, Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with representatives of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Both ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Sandra White. Uh, I thank, thank the Cabinet Secretary for the reply. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, now that the Scottish Government have unveiled their dementia strategy, which is very welcome, can I ask if it is the Scottish Government's intention to encourage both NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and other NHS bodies to engage with the You Can Make a Difference campaign led by Dementia Carer Voices who have campaigned tirelessly on behalf of those affected by dementia? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, can I say to Sandra, well, I, I certainly welcome the launch of the dementia strategy. I think it builds on the considerable good work that's been done uh, already, particularly with uh, third sector organisations and we're certainly pleased as a government to support the work on Dementia Care of Voices providing funding until April of next year and recognising the importance of leadership by local NHS boards and action to support this so I, I certainly will reiterate that to them uh, in partnership with the Alliance work is, is underway with all NHS boards to develop a programme for this work and events have already taken place in Ayrshire and Arne and the Western Isles. And Annie Wells. Thank you. Statistics this week show that the Glasgow Royal Infirmary was the worst performing emergency department in Scotland. Only 87.9% of patients were seen within four hours, compared to the 95% target set by the Scottish Government. What action will the Cabinet Secretary take to improve waiting times at this hospital? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, can I first of all say to Annie Wells that uh, any performance has improved significantly uh, over the last uh, few months, and that's due to a lot of work uh, that's been uh, taking place with boards around unscheduled care performance, working with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine to make sure that the actions taken in every hospital uh, has led and resulted in the improvements in A&E uh, performance that we have seen, uh, including at the, the Queen Elizabeth. The GRI uh, has had some challenges over the last few weeks, and that's why uh, support work tailored to the, the Glasgow Royal Infirmary uh, is underway to make sure that the, the work that has gone on at the Queen Elizabeth and has begun to to see results, particularly over the last few weeks, uh, is uh, supporting staff within the Glasgow Royal Infirmary to do the same. But I would hope that Annie Wells might find it within her to recognise the progress that has been made on a and &E performance across Scotland, which is now uh, significantly better than elsewhere in these islands. Perhaps you could welcome that occasionally. Jackie Bailey. At least a dozen service reviews in train causing continuing uncertainty at the Vale of Leven Hospital, maternity proposals on pause, 300 people at a public me meeting this week expressing real concern about cuts to out-of-hours services. The Cabinet Secretary tells me that she is committed to the Vale of Leven Hospital. When will she tell that to the Health Board and when will she come and listen to my local community? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well... I and the Health Board are committed to the Vale of Leaven Hospital and of course it was this government that saved the Vale of Leaven Hospital from the closure that would have undoubtedly happened under Jackie Bailey's, Jackie Bailey's government, of which I remember she was a minister within at the time. In terms of the specifics of the Vale of Leaven, uh, I uh, can say this to Jackie Bailey, that whether it's on out of hours, I know that the Chief Executive and the Chair of Greater Glasgow and Clyde are working very hard to maintain out of hours services, but it is challenging, as she will know from her discussion with the Chair around GPs being willing to work out of hours, uh, that is a challenge, uh, a challenge that we need to work through, and hopefully Jackie Bailey will help to encourage local GPs to come on to the out-of-hours rotas. I'm sure she will, because I'm sure she will want to be constructive uh, in these matters. And on maternity, I would have thought Jackie Bailey would have welcomed the pause on the review of maternity services, that she would want Glasgow and Clyde to look at the delivery of maternity services across uh, Glasgow and Clyde, and therefore to, to pause with the, the proposals that had been put forward for the Vale and the uh, Inverclyde Royal Infirmary. Perhaps it's, uh, occasionally she would welcome uh, actions taken by the board in order to make sure the right decisions are made. Question number six, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the review of student support. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. The independent review of student support chaired by Jane Ann Gadia has reached its midway point, a consultation to gather a wide range of views on how students across Scotland access, receive, manage and understand the support they receive will soon be published and I look forward to receiving the review's final report in the autumn. Ian Gray. Figures published uh, a couple of weeks ago show that on average the debt with which Scottish students leave university is now twice what it was in 2007 when the SNP came to power promising to abolish that debt altogether. Will the review go any way to writing this wrong? Minister. Well, the aim of this review is to assess the effectiveness of the support system for all students in further and higher education. Its entire purpose is to ensure the system is equitable, fair and supports all students, but particularly those facing disadvantage. So the review will, um, as it's independent of government, come to its own conclusions on that. But I'm afraid I will take absolutely no lessons from Ian Gray, whose party, of course, introduced tuition fees yeah. in Scotland yes. and higher education. Yeah. Yeah. And when we look at what's happening south of the border, where we have student debt in itchy in England, now on average £32,000, students across Scotland will be glad and thankful that it's this government that ensured that that didn't happen and looked to the Labour Party to admit that if, it had, if they had been in power in Scotland, they would be facing that level of debt as well. But thanks to the SNP and our continued support for free tuition, that will not happen here. Question 7, James Kelly. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is and calls for the repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act. Minister Annabel Ewing. 
Uh, offensive, hateful and prejudicial behaviour associated with football and online threats of violence and hatred continue to be a problem. I share the concerns expressed by equality groups that repealing the Act in the absence of a viable alternative will send entirely the wrong message to the public that expressions of prejudice and hatred at football matches are somehow condoned and decriminalised. We believe that police and prosecutors need appropriate tools to tackle hate crime, which is why I commissioned the Independent Review of Hate Crime Legislation in Scotland. I look forward to hearing the outcomes of that review next year and remain opposed to repealing the Act. James Kelly. Thank the Minister for the, an for the answer. It's now clear, uh, following on from the consultation for my private members' bill, that there's massive support and response to that for repeal of the Act. In addition to that, it's also clear that there is a majority in Parliament in favour of repeal of this Act. Bearing that in mind, uh, will the Minister agree to work with me on a sensible approach on repealing the Act and also work with parties in this Parliament and groups outside on a positive approach to behaviour at football and tackling sectarianism. Minister. What I, what I would say to the member is, is that this government, of course, stands on the side of the tens of thousands of football fans uh, across Scotland who simply want to go to a football match, take their fans. I find it very strange indeed that at a time where our society faces so many challenges, Labour's number one priority, number one priority for legislation is to repeal the Offensive Behaviour Act and that without offering any viable alternative. What a strange set of priorities indeed, presiding officer, and what contempt those priorities display for those who are targeted by hateful and prejudicial and abusive behaviour. Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's questions and question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you. So ask the First Minister what engagement she has.